So I promise this conversation is going to be lively. I just, you know, know it, not knowingly undersold. Good, right. Um, now, Johan Rupert has reinvented himself several times. Uh, he was into tobacco, and now he runs one of the top luxury companies in the world. Um, he was on the right side of history when it came to judging where apartheid was going. Uh, he was a great friend, I think I can say that, of Nelson Mandela, um, and perhaps uh, not a great friend of uh, one or two of his successors. Um, no, one of his successors. One of his successors, exactly. <laughs> uh, this is a little bit of precision here. Um, so, if we're talking about precision, was no, I it... I like the other two. Yes, yeah. So, so before we talk about the, wide, the bigger picture of the continent and where it's going and where there are one or two success stories, I, I do want to ask you about South Africa. Um, you heard the president today. Um, are you confident in the short term? You know, Lionel, when the ANC took over and when democracy came, they were totally shocked at the state of the finances. <clears throat> they had no idea about the debt. And if I recall the six, eight, nine years prior to the first democratic elections, and I compare them to the last six or seven, eight years, um, we've been through that before. Debt stands still crisis upon crisis. That one was inflicted upon us by the Nationalist Party. And the latest one by a rogue element in the ANC. And they managed to balance the budget uh, under President Mandela and Trevor and uh, the finances and, and uh, under President Becky and things were going well. So with the proper leadership, ethical leadership, uh, things can return a lot quicker than uh, what people fear. How much time does the president have? I asked him earlier. And he, he's a practitioner of strategic patience, and you're a practitioner of impatience. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't put it like that, but in business, impatience gets you there quicker than patience. So. Uh, we have only three answers, yes, no, or I don't know and I'll find out. And uh, so I don't think you can do that when you run a country. How much time does he have? Uh, well, I think his next uh, time that he's got to go to a conference is in 2022. But he is really the president of the country, not the president of the ANC. And I think the majority of South Africans would like him to act as the president of the country, and not only as the president of the ANC. So he has the goodwill of the majority of South Africans. He polls a lot higher than the ANC as a party. And uh, people are really, uh, envious of countries like Ethiopia, where I had the privilege of sitting next to the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources last night, and she asked me what happened. Because in 2011, they came and they benchmarked against ESCOM. And that was a mere eight years ago. And she was saying, well, what happened? where they now, with two hydroelectric dams... In Uganda. In Uganda. Yeah, did I not say Uganda? Sorry. I, I didn't Sorry, want Uganda. To. Sorry, Uganda. Yeah. No, obviously yeah. Uganda. Um, and biomass, solar, oil discoveries, Tala. And this morning, she was on a road show with Schlumberge to have new blocks to auction off new blocks. Now that's the way South Africa should be run. 
And I think the president's got more time than you think. Uh, but what would we you... are all impatient. No, we'll all. You know, let's. I mean, we've got Africa in motion. Right. One last question, <clears throat> and then I'll move to the wider continent. Just supposing you were in charge, what would you do with ESCOM? <coughs> be, be, be I, or, I or Jabu Mbuso, who's a very close friend of mine, why did you accept the job if you lost my, your mind? So um, what would I do with Eskom? <clears throat> yes, split it in three, but I would privatize as much of the SOEs, as many of them as I could, and create competition. You know, they know it's not a secret. I've had a hydroelectric plant that I built on my farm. It's been connected to the grid for three years, but I can't switch it on because of red tape and in the previous regime bribes. So the electricity is running into the sea. So it's, I have hope for South Africa because the, we are coming off such a low base. Uh, that we've done it before and we'll do it again. Right. Let's but but Africa, what I don't understand here Africa. on Africa, okay, so most the Americans yeah, come, then they say, they come and see me, they want to, to do Africa in two weeks. And I go, you know. And I found this wonderful map where you fit the whole of the United States, the whole of uh, Mexico, then you go to the whole of Europe, the old Eastern and Western Europe, you fit the whole of China and the whole of India and Japan, and including, this is pre-Brexit, Great Britain, this little <laughs> spot down there. And then I say, uh, you're gonna visit this place in two weeks. And uh, Mercator created this wonderful map in the 16th century for navigational purposes, but it gives totally the wrong idea of the size of Africa. I mean, Africa is vast. And I don't think most people understand that that also creates logistical nightmares. Transport. We don't have the navigable rivers, the roads. I mean, it's a very, very big continent. We've done... I mean, I remember I was firstly an investment banker. I was the I first, won't hold it first, against distri you. Uh, first Apple distributor in South Africa. We started Vodacom, the mobile first business. So yes, we were in tech all along. We've just, we're getting close to 12,000 kilometers of fiber that we lay. Uh, so we see many parts of the economy. But you know, then you take 1.34 billion people <clears throat> the vast continent. And yet, our GDP is, what, 40% Africa's GDP of Japan's. So 150, 60 years ago, the per capita income of people across the world, roughly the same. It didn't really matter where you lived. But then some countries made certain choices and other countries made other choices on how to govern themselves. We heard very eloquently from the previous speakers, freedom of speech, transparency, rule of law, private property, the sanctity of rule of law, and the divergence kicked in. And it has nothing to do with ethnicity. I went to East Germany shortly after the wall fell. I was shocked to see. And North Korea, the average North Korean is something like five centimeters shorter than the average South Korean, but they chose to govern themselves in certain ways. And in Africa, unfortunately, we've had choices in terms of our governance that's not produced the correct results. And when I hear colonialism, then I think of Singapore. Singapore was a colony as well. And I was fortunate to know Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. He never complained about that. They just got on, they studied, they saved, and they worked. 
Where do you see the bright spots on the continent in terms of countries? Let's get to, I would down say to the names. younger. I would say the bright spot is the younger group of people that are connected. Mm -hmm. When I walk around here, and half of the people like they know my daughter. My daughter's from Cape Town. She's, you know, I mean, the next generation are connected, and I'm not sure they're going to tolerate the nonsense that my generation had to pit up, put up with. They're more connected. Uh, what does that mean, then? They're not going to put up with it? My dad used to say that you can't sleep if your neighbor doesn't eat. That used to be applicable in his generation. Today, your neighbor sleeps next to you in Facebook. <laughs> the world, there, there is a, a connectivity globally today where uh, injustices are noticed a lot more easily, which I think is good. So, and uh, transparency makes it, and the youth have got a lower threshold. <coughs> They're not gonna put up with what we put up in our generation, so they'll hold their leaders more accountable. They're more politically active, do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. I have empathy with these eco-terrorists in, in uh, London. <clears throat> That's one of the more surprising things you've said today. But, uh... <laughs> I've always been involved in uh, conservation. I'm not happy with the way they're going about it. Hmm. But it's something that, you know, it's an existential risk that nobody talks about, but... It, to me, it's an example of people expressing their minds. If you look around the continent, where do you think there are the spots are in, in terms of good governance? Well, it's obvious that you can see Ethiopia and what they've achieved over here. And I was very impressed by Uganda. Uh, I do believe South Africa, if you look at how civil society changed the uh, regime and it was it was we've got an independent uh, bench the the judges are under fire but they independent and uh, it was civil society I mean, there, there are some very interesting things that were perhaps not known that uh, the previous people actually tried to lean on the head of the military during the tense times, at, during the final period in the elections, and he said, I'm sorry, I serve the Constitution. I do not serve the president. So they're very, very good signs of civil society saying we won't tolerate that anymore. Mm. And the president, in fact, I told him a story today that, uh, Gaynor and I were very fortunate to be close to President Mandela. And when he said, I'm resigning, I'm doing one term, because I want to set an example to the rest of Africa. I must say he did regret it later on. <laughs> when he was outlasted by decades by some of his contemporaries. But so we asked him, so who do you want to take over? And he said, no, Mr. Mabeki. And I was surprised. I said, not President Amaposa. He said, no, I want the young man to go out and make money. I've said to Dr. Motlana, he must go and make money so that when he comes back to be president, he can not be bribable. Now, I didn't quite understand it in those days, but he said, no, I want him to go out to make money. Legally very legally, but, yeah, but I want him to go into the private sector. Yes. And, you know, Errol Flynn years ago said, the problem with my life is that my gross needs exceed my net income. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm afraid if you look at who became bribable, they all had that problem. 
Some say you can tell someone by your enemies better than your friends. And I would, it was G.T. Ferrari, the banker, his mother, 90th birthday, and she said, you've got to remember one thing. You're known by your friends, but you're also known by your enemies. Yes. Yeah. Just, just tell us very briefly, what was it like living through that period when you were being targeted? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I had, I had General Malan, uh I was more scared of him. Uh, <laughs> tell me the politics is a cutthroat business and that he meant it literally. And this was, in, <laughs> and this was in front of Gavin Reilly. I mean, it was quite amazing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we have a saying, you know, cowboys don't cry. I mean, if, if things are wrong, it's... You know, Martin Luther King said, what did he, uh, you know, this, the hottest place in hell is reserved for people who do not speak out in times of great moral conflict. Yes. The toughest thing for me, funnily enough, Lionel, was not the attacks, not the lies, the bots, etc. It was the silence of your friends. That was the toughest one. Uh, in the uh, press? Well, I mean, which, which friends are you talking about? No, generally, you know, yeah. people duck and dive duck when and they're dive, under yeah. fire, you know, and, uh, uh, and remember, I didn't pick the fight with President Zuma. No. It was, in fact, them targeting our now current president. Mm. When they got rid of Minister Nene, when he wouldn't sign that nuclear deal. That's the Putin deal. The, well, I'm not saying it's the president Sorry, it's the Putin. Russian, it's the Russian, the Russian deal. deal. Yeah. I don't want him as an enemy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's, get, let's get things straight. Okay. By the way, nor do I. <laughs> mm -mm. No. Um, three months later, suddenly we got attacked. Uh, he said that I'd flown back from England and that I'd called the deputy president and asked him to come to my office. And it was all nonsense. Um, firstly, I'd kept about 4,000 students as the chancellor in the weeks leading up, so I was there. And, um, but, you know, Mrs. Thatcher once said to me, uh, Say what you think and do what you say. But she should have added, think what you say as well, because <laughs> I then made a small lapse and President Zuma said, you know, and then he pleaded, or he said to the nation, if you want me to go, I will go. So. The real story is we were sitting with friends around a barbecue in the in Bahamas and some Pinot Noir had uh, been <laughs> had gotten involved. So I added I added a little sentence, yes, Mr. President, on behalf of the children, please go. Oof, and that set off the chain reaction. And uh, but they were really targeting President Zuma, they weren't targeting President, me. Ah, President, Ramaphosa. Uh, Prima, President Ramaphosa. Mm. They, uh, so by association, so I, I haven't seen the president, seen him twice in four years, five years. And uh, we used to see each other quite a lot in the early 90s, mostly adversarial. He was the head of a trade union. And he then was an investor in MTN, and we had Vodacom, so we mm. were competing in cellular and mobile telephony. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that we could facilitate a meeting today between you and the president. Well, it was, it was nice to see him, yes. <laughs> it was, you know, but it's, it's actually so sad that if you're a businessman, you can't speak to the president of your country. Uh, it's, uh, and it's been like that for a long time, whereas with President 
Mbeki, obviously we were very fortunate with President Mandela, he adopted us like children, but with President Mbeki, we, had, we still have very friendly, cordial relationships, and he had an advisory board. And uh, things started going south uh, after uh, he got um, thrown out. I mean, let's not mince words. Uh, and so the rot is deep, it's wide, it's up to municipal level, and it's shocking to see how quickly it can happen. But the fight back, uh, well, President Ramaphosa is running a clean government, and the investment uh, sentiment will get back. And quite frankly, I think we're going to outperform the UK post-Brexit. We're going to outperform Europe. We're going to outperform the United States. Is when these professors finish with their experiment of negative interest rates. When Lionel, we discussed. We did. Greece got paid to borrow money two weeks ago. Sorry, I'll repeat that. <laughs> they paid Greece money to borrow. The country that was almost crashed out of the Eurozone. Um, just to go back, one little thing. On South Africa, do, do you think the figure of 500 billion rand is correct, or is a trillion rand correct when describing the amount stolen during the Zuma years? Firstly, somebody said President Ramaphosa said a trillion. He didn't say a trillion. Could be. It, yeah, it could be, but we don't know yet. Uh, it could be, yes. It could very well be. We don't know how wide and deep it is. Uh, but how could it just get to that size? You know, we have a saying in our company, well, I've always believed in Seneca that there are times that the law allows what ethics and modesty should prohibit. So the law can be rather wide at times. And if you have smart corporate lawyers, they duck and dive. But if you don't want to sit on the front page of a newspaper, don't do it. So maybe we've got a narrower restriction, but we believe culture is set from the top. And we're more interested in culture than in PowerPoints and slides and presentations. And if you clean at the top, it sets an example, and then you can uh, act if the top is problematical. And in the end, societies get, end up with what they incentivize. And it became a free fall, but it's over. And I'm actually, frankly, more concerned Let's take Europe. I was with the top automobile executive three weeks ago. In his bigger group, the biggest margin is one brand, which is 10%. Going electric, it's going to drop to 2%. They think a million and a half people will lose their jobs by going green. I think if you go and look at anti-fragility. Africa's not fragile because we haven't even moved in the direction of fragility. Europe's fragile. A million and a half people losing their jobs in the automobile industry. Where are they going to be absorbed? That's the new German question. Our last discussion, where you conned me into a... Uh, I said to you that we're going to have... A, is that a technical term? <laughs> we're going to have ruptures. Let me tell you, anybody you who you asks, anybody who, who controls the Lex column can ask me to come and talk at this. Uh, <laughs> this man is very important to me. But, <laughs> no, 
it was obvious that our society was going to rupture and tear. Mm. It was obvious. So it's torn. And I don't know how in the modern... That was 2014, I think. 2014. Which was, you know, pre-Brexit by two years um, and also yeah. pre-Trump. The tragedy is that people are winning elections by promoting... Uh, tearing the fabric. I mean, look at what we did. We invade, well, not we, some of us invaded Iraq, destabilized the whole place, Syria, and then we say, whoa, you can't come into our countries. You know, the historical mistakes that we in the West have made and that our children are going to mm. suffer from. Mm. And now Brexit and Mr. Trump so, frankly, everything is comparable, and I prefer Africa's chances for the next decade, where we haven't had the privilege of negative real interest rates, and where our base is so low that if we do things half right, our growth rate should exceed yours. Five, six percent back I, or it more? Should, it should be higher. It should be higher. You know, the, the lady before talked about the rule of 72s. You know, at 7%, it's a decade. I was trying to explain to the previous regime, if you grow 12% in six years, that you double the standard of living. The Chinese were growing at 12%. If you're growing at 2%, it takes 36 years. So let's try and get it to, in the high single figures at least, I, th I really believe that with the right policies, and we, we don't have to repeat the policies, but with the right policies, we will have a higher growth rate. Because I cannot see, we discussed the ECB earlier on, what's the next silver bullet, Lionel? There's not many shots left in the locker. You can't cut interest rates. So what's the silver bullet if Europe does start stagnating? We've got time for one last question, so I'm going to ask the, a really... This is a difficult question. It's so easy. You, you we won't... will play you in the World Cup that's final. That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> so, that's it. You guessed it. You guessed it. <laughs> Don't... Don't go and bet on it, because the last time he caught me was just before an Ashes series, where I laughed and I said, you have no chance, and they whitewashed the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much.